today I'm going to continue to talk about this book, Nietzsche, Prophet of Nazism, The Cult of the Superman. Again, I will be discussing this. First, uh, the title of this video will be Esoteric Nazism Beyond Good and Evil. Beyond Good and Evil is one of Nietzsche's books. Of course, Nietzsche didn't write in book format, but it is one of his books now. Um, first, I'd like to talk about what Taha is trying to say with this book, his thesis. Um, this reads like a doctorate thesis, maybe graduate level thesis. So I imagine this might have been his thesis in college and he incorporated it into a book. Taha's thesis is that Nietzsche was someone that the Nazis drawn upon completely that he was every bit a Nazi before the Nazis were around, more or less. Um, a lot of people say that Nietzsche uh, did not influence the Nazis. Of course he, he did. <clears throat> a lot of people say that Nietzsche was not, he did not have those tendencies, the racism, the um, nationalism, the other things that the Nazis were. And uh, Taha is making the, uh, the claim, and he is using a lot of uh, sources to uh, back it up. But uh, in fact, Nietzsche was a Nazi before there were Nazis. Um, so I wanted to get into to his thesis statement because it is his book that I am discussing. Um, <clears throat> First of all, today, let's talk about transcending good and evil. This idea of good and evil, it's not uh, outside of the Judeo-Christian ethics the idea of good and evil is much, much different for other cultures. And uh, we living in this culture, we don't see that. I don't see it. I don't, I, I, I can't even see it growing up myself, a uh, Christian, as many of you, of you have, I imagine. If you speak English, uh, chances are you grew up Christian, or at least in a Christian culture. So, transcending good and evil, one of Nietzsche's ideas was that uh, the concepts that we have of good and evil are antiquated and related to Christianity and Christianity's rather foolish look at uh, what's good and what's evil. Of course, Nietzsche had very good points. Um, I don't agree with everything he says. Of course, I don't agree with everything anyone says. But Nietzsche was a brilliant man, and he did have uh, very good points when it came to uh, the concept of good and evil. What is it? Well, let's first go to a quote from the book so that you can see where Nietzsche stands with regards to this. I entreat you, my brothers, remain true to the earth, and do not believe those who speak to you of superterrestrial hopes. They are poisoners, despires of life. Once blasphemy against God, was the greatest blasphemy, but God died, and thereupon these blasphemies died too. 
To blaspheme the earth is now the most dreadful offense, and to esteem the bowels of inscrutable more highly than the meaning of the earth. Frederick Nietzsche Now, to Nietzsche and later the Nazis, the afterlife was... Well, it was something that you shouldn't concern yourself with. This is something, as a Buddhist, I can definitely agree with and feel uh, understanding of where they're coming from. I personally have never spent much time thinking about what comes up, of what comes after this life. I have been asked my opinion with regards to that, um, and I respond when someone asks what comes after death, I say, well, what comes after birth? The idea that we are so structured in our mind that everything is this dichotomy, this, this, this polar opposite. You either go to heaven or hell when you die. And it's always a Christian heaven and a Christian hell. Folks, can, can we honestly say, I mean, none of us know what happens after we die, but the thing is, the idea that there's only two choices is, is, is as ridiculous as telling a baby that was just born telling their parents that this baby only has two choices. This baby can be a policeman or a fireman. It's ridiculous. So, Nietzsche and the Nazis were centered upon this life, which the Christian church doesn't want you to be concerned with. The Christian church, which is just an arm, it is now, it always has been really, uh, it's either been against the state or it's, or it's supported the state, it just, it, it'll support one state or another, uh, that is government. The Christian church wants you to be interested in heaven or hell and not concern yourself with the things of this world. Well, we live in this world. So the reality is we live in this world. The Buddha did not teach about what comes after after this life. Nirvana is not something that is spoken of in any great detail. And it shouldn't be. If you're interested in those kinds of things, you need to be a Christian or a Jew. Well, Jews don't really believe in an afterlife either. But uh, you need to be a Christian or Muslim. Let's look at another quote uh, from Nietzsche. Here he talks about the earth, and when he does, he's just he's speaking of this life, is what the reference here. For Nietzsche, quote, it was suffering and impotence that created all afterwards the concept God, invented as an antithetical concept to life. The concept the beyond real world invented so as to deprive of value the only world which exists so as to leave over no goal no reason no task for our earthly reality unquote. therefore it is only through the elimination of the transcendental concept of god as an external abstract notion alien to man's life and purpose in this world that we can hope to restore human greatness, a greatness which prevailed in ancient pre-Christian pagan times, before the invention of morality. Only thus would Christian morality, the denial of life, cease to be an aim of life, an aim of evolution. As has hitherto been the case, 
for, quote, our greatest reproach against existence was the existence of God, unquote. In other words, the, quote, death of God, unquote, is man's great liberation for only by, quote, unquote, killing this external concept can humanity aspire to earthly perfection. Within the framework of the, of the last two chapters that, uh, the, that I'm discussing here, <clears throat> this is the part that interests me personally the most, and that's when it comes to concerning ourselves with the here and now. <clears throat> the Buddha and even the Christ uh, was interested in the here and now, the whole concept of, uh, of let's not worry about what's going on here, let's only worry about our mortal soul, that, in, that idea is what caused the Dark Ages. Now, the Dark Ages continued for quite some time until during the Crusades, the Christians who had gone out and seen the Arabs, the Muslims, and seen how they live, they said, hmm, you know what? I don't like living the way we're living back home anymore. I don't like, you know, crapping in a bucket and throwing it out in the street. The I <laughs> Christianity even more than Judaism or Muslim. The Muslims have really, aside from their very barbaric belief system, when they, you know, I mean, they still stone people to death. But aside from that, they have contributed a lot. They contributed algebra. They've contributed all kinds of things. While the Christians were crapping in buckets and throwing them out in the street. If you've seen the Monty Python movie where they say the joke is, how do you know who's the king? He's the only one who doesn't have shit on his face. Old Monty Python joke. After saying that, let me uh, give you a couple of quotes from uh, very enlightened people. Uh, the first quote will be from the Buddha, and the second quote will be from the Christ. Do not dwell in the past. Do not dream of the future. Concentrate the mind on the present moment. Buddha. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Matthew six thirty four, New International Version. So, when it came to the here and now, to Nietzsche and to the Nazis, they believed that action, action spoke louder than words. They believed that action was the end all of doing things. It wasn't, it wasn't a matter of you do this action in order to obtain a certain ending action was the end all and be all of everything uh, might makes right let's look at another quote from the book Nazism also sought spiritual and racial perfection in Nietzsche's kingdom of earth rejecting any reality in the beyond and affirming instead in Hitler's words Quote, in the beginning was action, unquote. The only thing that mattered was action, not the search for a transcendental truth. For action itself was the key to understanding and becoming conscious of the essence of the universe. Indeed, quote, if Nazism was a religion, it was a religion whose offered no other place to go to. In Nazi propaganda, the racial purge through which the Germans become Germanic is ideologically accomplished in the future state, which is constructed paradoxically 
as a return to the pre-existing truth. The Nazi idea was not simply metaphysical, but ontological, unquote. As before, I spoke of the unity between good and evil. It is a unifying force. The, the concept of good and evil is something that is intergrained. Uh, everything in our culture, again, everything in our culture seems to be structured around black and white. It's not black and white. It's black and white. It's not black or white. It's black and white. It's gray. There are very few black and whites. Um, we can we we can point at certain things if it, as being morally wrong. Of course, there's no. Um, it, it's not all subjective. But um, the funny thing is, the Christians want to have it both ways. When you read things in the in the Old Testament of God's okay with slavery. God's okay with rape, God's okay with murder, and you point it out to the Christians, they suddenly become uh, someone who thinks of moral things as being subjective. You can't have it both ways, Christians. If you say there's black and white, then, and then there's standards to be held up to, then your God needs to be held up to those standards as well. But I digress. Uh, about the unity of good and evil, here is another quote from the book. Thus, for both Nietzsche and the Nazis, reality was neither good nor evil, neither spirit nor matter, but rather the unity of these notions. One, quote, one should write of the unity of good and evil, the inseparability of one from the other make good more attractive by giving it violent and exciting company, unquote, wrote Nietzsche, stressing the organic and fundamental unity of all of nature. Both doctrines aspire to totality, striving against the separation of mind and body, in order to attain perfection symbolized by the union between Apollyon and Dionysian spirits. Nazis and Nietzsche also spoke of a master and slave mentality. You know, of course they're going to make themselves the masters. You know, of course they're going to make themselves the masters. So I don't know where uh, where they can really come off by saying this particular race should be the master race. And this is coming from somebody who is Aryan. I am Anglo-Saxon. I'm Aryan. Like in, I'm, I'm 6'3". I weigh 240 pounds. Obviously, I'm white. So, I am from, I have North, Northern Europe blood in me. So, coming from an Aryan who has known many people, from many different cultures, many different religions, many different races, uh, this idea that one race should be the master race and the other should be slaves is ridiculous. The slave mentality, however, it does run rapid within the Christian church. They are slaves to an entity that they don't see, they can't hear, they Nietzsche refers to the Christians as slaves on a regular basis. He should. That's what they are. They call themselves sheep. He's the good shepherd. What does that make Christians? So, the Aryan masters of uh, Nazism. Uh, let's look at another 
quote from the book. Nietzsche's master morality may be sum summarized as follows, quote, The cowardly, the timid, the petty, and those who think only of narrow utility are despised. The noble types of man feel himself to be the determiner of values. He creates values. Everything he knows to be a part of himself, be honor, such as morality, is self-glorification. In foreground stands a feeling of plenitude, of power which seeks to overflow, the happiness of high tension, the consciousness of wealth which would be like to give away or bestow. The noble human being to aids the unfortunate, but not, or almost not, from pity, but from an urge begotten by superfluity of power. Nietzsche was the one who brought about the idea of this master race. It's important in our discussion about the Nazis to get into their, their racism, their obvious racism. As I previous, previously stated, if it's just a spiritual thing where they're bringing up the people who have stronger spiritual understanding, and there should be a standard that's set for that. I can't come off offhand what that was, but you know it. You know when somebody's spiritually in tune and when somebody's not. Um, a friend of mine says often to me, you don't get angry at a five-year-old because they're short and stupid. Many of us as humans have advanced to a higher level spiritually whether we were born with it or not. Um, most of us were born with it. And that comes from years and years of being reincarnated. This is what I, this is what I know. Uh, people who don't believe in reincarnation, uh, you know, don't believe in the sun, don't believe in the stars, because reincarnation is real. We are reincarnated, and I think that I have met some people, mostly online, that I believe, I honestly believe in their previous life they were an animal. When it comes to spiritual understanding, the people who have already lived multiple lives are certainly going to be more spiritually in tune. Those, peoples, those people shouldn't be rulers. I don't believe in that. Um, I'll get into my uh, ideas when it comes to government in a minute. But those people, I believe, should be teachers, not rulers. Teachers. Uh, here we have another uh, another reading from the book. In sharp contrast to the master morality, the slave morality is a creation of resentment against the strong against the masters. It builds its opposing values of good and evil as a reaction to the master's opposition, good and bad. It considers the noble notion of good and evil, while it endorses the master's conception of bad as its highest good. Nietzsche thus highlights the main feature of this decadent morality, the morality of the, quote, abused, oppressed, suffering, unfree, those uncertain of themselves, and weary. Quote, a pessimistic mistrust of the entire situation of man. The slave is suspicious of the virtues of the powerful. He is skeptical and mistrustful, keenly mistrustful of everything, quote, good that is honored among them. On the other hand, pity the kind of helping hand, the warm heart, patience, industriousness, humility, friendliness, come into honor. Slave morality is essentially the morality of utility. Here is the source of the famous antithesis, 
good and evil. Power and danger were felt to exist in evil. Thus, according to slave morality, the evil inspire fear. According to master morality, it is precisely the good who inspire fear and want to inspire it, while the bad man is judged contemptible. Whoever, wherever slave morality comes to predominate, language exhibits a tendency to bring the words good and stupid closer to each other. In short, unquote, in short, the slave Morality is the reaction of the weak, the wretched, and the world-weary against the strong. Healthy arist aristocratic types, it belongs to the herd animals, who are levelers of their values, r relax life to an average, mediocre performance. As far as Nietzsche and the Nazis are concerned, the will to power was what mattered. That is what made someone good. Someone's willingness to control and dominate others. Uh, I see their point, but I don't agree with it. Uh, there have been many people who have not felt it necessary to be in positions of authority in order to get done what they wanted to get done. It is true, however, as it says in this next reading I'll, I'll do, that the Jews and the Christians have given up any kind of, any real power over themselves to their God. And I'll have this uh, reading here. For Nietzsche and Nazism, Hence, what is good is everything that proceeds from an increased power, and what is bad is everything that is weak. Therefore, an action acquires its value not depending on whether it is intrinsically good or evil, but on whether it guarantees and increases power, and hence leads to spiritual progress, to the, to the self-overcoming of the human species. And history shows that great cultures have mostly arisen by means of powerful and immoral actions, which are highest manifestation of the will to power principle inherent in nature. Therefore, quote, the great epochs of our life are the occasions where we gain the courage to rebaptize our evil qualities as our best qualities. Man must grow better and more evil. Unquote, teaches Nietzsche, for, quote, the most evil is necessary to the superman straight, unquote. The Nazis couldn't have agreed more with this blunt statement celebrating the will to power as a philosophy beyond good and evil. To Nietzsche and to the Nazis, everything was about conflict. Everything was about conflict. And the will of power was determined through struggle. Uh, mein Kampf, my struggle. Everything is about conflict. So, here we have another couple of readings from the book um, about that. Life is an eternal struggle, a world where one creature feeds on the other and where the death of the weaker implies the life of the stronger. That is the basically aristocratic principle of nature, the victory of the stronger over the weaker as a means to breed life as a whole towards a higher level as the precondition for all human progress. Adolf Hitler. War, Hitler believed, is the natural order of things. It is the great purifier, man's natural state, mankind, quote, has grown great in eternal struggle, unquote. History is a perpetual and merciless struggle for life. Therefore, to the Fuhrer, he, uh, quote, he who walks, wants to live might fight, and he who does not want to fight in this world of eternal struggle does not deserve to be alive, unquote. 
That was the aristocratic principle of nature which the SS adopted, wearing with pride the Totenkopf death's hand as a symbol of their willingness to give and take death unhesitant, unhesitantly in the holy cause of National Socialism. The idea that we need to be in perpetual state of war is basically what, what they're proposing. Seems like we've had presidents who seem to believe that here in the United States to continue the uh, the control they have over over people and the uh, continue the economy based on military industrial complex. The truth is there's been a lot of people who have made differences that did not feel that war was the necessary means to make that difference. Gandhi, of course. And in this country, um, someone who, who I look up to, I do, um, someone who I think was a great man who used Gandhi's tactics, and that was Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King is remembered for a lot of things, but what's not discussed, and something that I am more aware of than most laymen, because I have had to take Alabama history in college, so um, we delved a lot into, into uh, the Civil Rights Movement, of course. Um, Martin Luther King is not regarded as being a very brilliant uh, tactician, a brilliant politician, as much as as the other things people say about him. He was he was a brilliant politician, and he knew what he was doing. The idea of uh, passive resistance is. If you're willing to do it, if you're willing to just lay there and allow people to beat you, then, um, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for somebody who can do that. Um, somebody who, who always feels that uh, if someone hits you, you hit back. Of course, turn the other cheek idea uh, oftentimes does not work. But you need to know when to do it and when not to do it. And when it came to the civil rights struggle, uh, Martin Luther King knew that if he made sure that the cameras were rolling and that people would see school children getting knocked over by water hoses and school children having big dogs in their face barking that uh, the rest of the country may actually pay attention to what was going on. So, in that, he was a politician. Don't forget that. Now let's talk briefly about, here at the end, about the, um, the ideas of government. Nazis hated socialism. They hated socialism, they hated democracy. I understand that a majority rule can be just as tyrannical as any tyrant can be. I certainly agree with that. Me, if you had to, uh, well, let, let, let's first, let's look at a, um, Let's look at another quote from the book about uh, democracy. The socialist conception of the highest society is the lowest in the order of rank, Nietzsche. The Jewish doctrine of Marxism rejects the aristocratic principles of nature and replaces the eternal privilege of power and strength by the mass of numbers and their dead weight. Hitler. 
democracy represents the disbelief in great human beings and in an elite society. Everyone is equal to everyone else. Nietzsche. By rejecting the authority of the individual and replacing it by the number of some momentary mob, the parliamentary principle of majority rule sins against the basic aristocratic principles of nature. Hitler. Does this present not belong to the mob? Mob above, mob below. What are poor and rich today? I unlearned this distinction. Nietzsche. The Western democracy of today is a forerunner of Marxism, which without would not be thinkable. It provides this worldly plague with a culture in which its germs can spread. Hitler. Now then, again, let's talk about my favorite subject, me. If you had to ask, if I had to answer what kind of government structure I believe in, it's no government. It's no government. I don't believe in government. I believe the government is something that just simply gets in our way. It's, most people are not going to go out and just start going on killing sprees. It's not going to happen. Those kind of people, <coughs> those kind of people, you get a posse, you grab them and you string them up. That's the way they used to do it. So I believe in what's called anarchy. <coughs> no government at all. Now Lucy, on the other hand, she's a monarchist as long as she can be queen. Anyway, um, <clears throat> getting serious again. That was a joke. Uh, getting serious. The Nazis were against race mixing, of course. Uh, they're eugenics. The idea that somehow the Aryan race was somehow superior to other races, and it, it, they wouldn't come up with that if, of course, they weren't Aryan. And, I mean, looking at Hitler, I'm, what was he, 6'7", I mean, 5'7", uh, maybe? I'm much more Aryan than he is. So, I mean, the races have been been mixing for quite some time, folks. It's very few people that have pure bloodlines, regardless of what race you are. So, this eugenics and race mixing is just it's juvenile. It's silly to be against it. We have been, uh, mix, the mixing of races has gone on for a long, long time. Any of you got Italian in you? Yeah. Especially uh, <clears throat> Sicilian, then you have African in you as well. So, <clears throat> this is <clears throat> eugenics and race mixing is rather silly. Here at the end, I want to talk briefly, <clears throat> again, also, about. Uh, this 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 whole idea this male and female obviously Nietzsche and and Hitler were uh, really into men you know the the guys that that keep their hair short and um, maybe military types and they are always talking about how men need to be men and so on and so on. They're usually the closet gays. They normally are. I mean, somebody who looks like me, who wears their hair long and wears earrings, look, we're not trying to hide anything about ourselves. They are. Anyway, this whole idea of male and female is somehow female is submissive and therefore weak is another thing that uh, that 
they allude to, but do not say directly. Here is a quote from Hitler. <clears throat> a peace supported not by the palm branches of tearful pacifist female mourners, but based on the victorious sword of master people putting the world into the service of a higher culture. Adolf Hitler. So the male and female idea that somehow the female is the weak. I've met lots of women who have the bravery it takes. It's all about conditioning. It's all about how you're raised. Because if you're raised and you're abused, normally it's when it happens. If you're abused as a woman, you're, you're either going to become so passive that uh, everybody walks over you or you're going to become more dominant. You're going to become <coughs> what's considered more masculine. It is a trait of, uh, of being more enlightened. The, this is an idea that goes back to Eastern mysticism and Taoism <coughs> that the more you become enlightened, the more like the opposite sex you become. And uh, whether it's it's males with these misogynist ideas or females who hate males, <clears throat> we are both in this together on, the, on this world. And a <clears throat> structure, if we're going to have a structure of government that would be best serving the people, would be a structure of government in which there are representation of both male and female, and all races for that matter, all races as well. <coughs> we get my <coughs> throat here, it's still early morning. Um, well, that's it for today. I will be doing one more probably won't be nearly as long. Uh, it might pique the interest of people who are looking for more um, more about the Jews and the Jewish question and, and so on. <clears throat> I will be discussing in the next video the history of the relationship between the Christians and the Jews and how you know, what uh, Hitler did was hardly in a vacuum and was not the first person to persecute the Jews um, <clears throat> and the other races he persecuted. Um, so that's it for today. I also will be getting into what I alluded to in the last video as far as why Hitler was wrong, not just morally wrong, but what he did was wrong in the sense that it, it just wasn't functionally, it, did, it didn't work. It didn't work. It wasn't practical what he did. So uh, and it, if it wasn't for Hitler, uh, who knows whether Israel would be a country. Let, let's be honest. And I'll be discussing that as well. So, thank you very much for those of you who actually sit through all, it's going to be a long video again, uh, I, I realize that they might not be quite as stimulating as some of the other videos, but I think it's a subject that uh, should be discussed, and I think it's a subject that should appeal to those intellectuals out there who who find the whole idea of Nazis and who they were and the, and the background of uh, Nietzscheism and the, the whole idea of, uh, of a counterbalance to the, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian ethics. So, thank you very much again for those who have gotten through this video as well. Next video, I 
will be putting up shortly. Thank you very much.